Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Neil Ward. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs here at UEA, and I'm delighted um, to be here this evening to introduce uh, the inaugural lecture of Professor Thomas Otte from the UEA's School of History. Uh, Thomas joined UEA in 2004, and he was promoted to Professor of Diplomatic History in 2012. Uh, he came to UEA via Cambridge and Birmingham Universities and the University of the West of England uh, with a year spent at the University of Hamburg. Uh, Thomas was an advisor to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office between 2006 and 2010 and has been a trustee of the Foreign Office Historical Collections uh, since 2009. He's the author or editor of 15 books uh, among the most recent is July 1914, Europe's Descent into War, which received one of the 2015 Prose Awards from the American Publishers Association in the category European and World History. Uh, it was described by the Wall Street Journal as a distinguished and readable book that offers much detail on the failings and miscalculations of politicians, soldiers and diplomats across Europe a forensic revisiting of the sources. Uh, Thomas is a highly regarded historian of Britain's relationships with other nations. But further to this, his wide linguistic skills enable him to examine firsthand the policies of foreign powers, uh, allowing him to contextualize British foreign policy in ways that few others can. Uh, he's currently working on a history of Europe's borderlands from 1500 to 1914 which will no doubt provide a novel view uh, of the region's development during this period. A deep understanding of Europe and its history has never been more important, given current levels of political uncertainty, Britain's recent decision to exit the European Union, and the alarming popularity uh, of uh, far-right groups across the continent, which seems to be on, on the rise. Uh, in his talk this evening, Thomas will examine the modern academic discipline of international history, outline its scope, and assess its value and relevance in today's society. So please join me now in welcoming Professor Thomas Otte to give his inaugural professorial lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends, uh, thank you very much uh, for coming here on such a cold uh, uh, evening, and uh, it's good to see that so many of you managed to resist the temptation of um, Sheffield United versus uh, Walsall this, this evening. Um, now, Mr. Pro Vice Chancellor, thank you very much for your kind uh, remarks. Your remarks are a timely reminder um, that one of the major aspects, no, actually, the major aspect of a university is research. In the, continued, uh, in the face of continued depredations by here today, gone tomorrow ministers, going against the grain of popular opinion that sees in a university education a uh, little more than a job training scheme, and at a time when experts are dismissed as an irrelevance, it seems more especially necessary not to lose sight of this aspect. This is how we contribute to society, and we should uh, defend it robustly. Now, let me turn to the task in hand, and here I must begin with a confession, a confession of ignorance. What exactly are inaugural lectures for? I, I don't know. I don't know whom or what they are to inaugurate. It is not the case that I lecture for the first time, either in this university or indeed in this room. I have documentary proof uh, to show you to, as evidence. Nor is it the case that the subject of international history is new to this institution. Uh, far from it, it has a well-established pedigree going back to the early years of UEA. So, what am I inaugurating? I'm inaugurating a chair, a professorship, and it is a most peculiar one. There is none like it in this country uh, or elsewhere, as far as I know. And although many have sailed under the same flag, none was called Professor of Diplomatic History. The choice of nomenclature was mine, and it seems I could hardly have chosen worse, could I? <laughs> For one thing, there is only 
one adjective. Uh, most chairs have two. Um, usually offering a more precise temporal or geographical uh, definition. And whereas the adjective chosen has, well, let's be honest, a slightly old-fashioned feel to it. And as if this were not bad enough, as Karl Popper once mischievously observed, international history is nothing but the history of international crime and mass murder. Be that as it may, diplomatic history has for long enjoyed a dubious reputation as being the most arid and sterile of all subdisciplines. Now, this is not a particularly recent development. There was much joy in certain circles in the early 1930s when the Royal Historical Society abandoned its own Camden series in diplomatic history, though this came as little surprise to one of its most distinguished practitioners who had long noticed that, and I quote, the medievalists were on the warpath and are just now in a peculiarly aggressive mood. And I think we all know the symptoms, don't we? Um, <laughs> I'm just saying this to wind up my medieval colleagues. Um, I, I really like them very much. Um, so it seems then, um, uh, uh, in the, the time-worn put-down, the diplomatic history was really little more than uh, what one clerk said to another. And often, perhaps, this was combined with an unhealthy dose of a belief in great men. And as with these great and sometimes not so great men, and occasionally women too, uh, as a recent reviewer in one of the Sunday papers noted, and I quote, diplomacy is an unfashionable activity, and those who practice it are treated with some contempt by politicians. So a defence then is necessary, an assertion of the justness and the relevance of the subject. And I'm taking my cue here from the title of the memoirs of a former permanent undersecretary, uh, of the Foreign Office, um, who called the fruits of his literary labours the inner circle, uh, falling back on an old Foreign Office joke, uh, a mild one even by the standards of that particular genre, according to which the Foreign Service uh, was likened to the, Lon to the London underground. Once a man was launched on the inner circle, London, Paris, Berlin, Rome, it was impossible to leave the track. So I want to take you on a circle line journey now uh, from uh, to the, out to the periphery of the field and then back. Now, there is, and I cannot deny it, a degree of tension between the two considerations of justness and relevance. I'm no relevantine. Uh, for the intellectual justification of a subject uh, cannot and should not be uh, determined by its practical value per se. Even so, the notion of history's um, practical relevance for public policy, the belief in the applicability of the lessons of history reaches back to the earliest attempts at understanding the past. There was, and there still is, a general assumption that we produce a sort of gesta romanorum type stock of instances and illuminations um, with the edifying conclusion, and this, my friends, ought to teach us, with several exclamation marks. Thucydides, whoops, Thucydides Machiavelli uh, wrote because they, were, uh, they thought they had detected certain patterns of historical development and because they were interested in distilling lessons of statecraft. In more modern times, George I founded the Regis Professorship of History, not so much to advance learning, but as a protective measure against the importation of foreign and better educated tutors. Little did the Hanoverian know. And to train young men capable of serving the king at home and abroad. A century and a half later, the then occupant of the Regis chair, Sir John Seeley, argued that history was nothing less than the school of statesmanship. And such views remained de rigueur uh, for a very long time. Now, as an established Subdiscipline, international history is of fairly recent vintage. It came into its own after the First World War, and it was only in the 1970s that it acquired the contemporary attributes of academic adulthood, university departments, dedicated journals, professional bodies, and conferences. 
there was nonetheless always an understanding that this emerging field was no pure history, that it had more than strictly scholarly value and aspirations. Donald Watt, in his much quoted 1983 inaugural lecture, memorably described international history in its early phase as disaster studies. Disaster because usually national defeat uh, triggered an interest in diplomatic history. Albert Sorel in France uh, after the 1870s began to work on diplomatic history and really developed it as a field. And the First World War had a similar effect on the discipline. This was a war in which many of the leading international historians of the interwar and early Cold War years had served at the front or in various um, intelligence roles. Pierre Renouvin and Egmont Sechlin, both of them uh, maimed in the war, were representative of the French and German profession. In Britain, it was secondment to Whitehall or political and military intelligence that sharpened an understanding that history mattered and that it was an indispensable ingredient in the process of framing a strategy. Such views played a role in fighting the war at a grand strategic level. They also played a crucial role in the immediate aftermath of the conflict. A number of historians came together in 1919 to found the British, now Royal, Institute of International Affairs. A few were well established, many more were mid-career, but all of them had earned their spurs in wartime intelligence and all would go on to make their names in academia. Soon, Chatham House forged a cadre of international relations specialists, most of whom were historically trained, and the institution's activities played a significant role in extending uh, the scope of British foreign policy in the 20th century. University teaching, too, reflected, um, uh, reflected the wave of post-1919 internationalism and was very much focused uh, on the demands of the present. We are seriously endeavouring, wrote Harold Temperley, he had served in War Office Intelligence, General Staff Intelligence during the war. We are seriously endeavouring to turn the serious attention of our young men in the direction of international politics and the League of Nations. Now, things didn't quite turn out as expected. In 1919, the post-war faith in the practical wisdom imparted by the study of history was misplaced. Internationalism and the League did not prevail. In the vanquished countries, but not just there, the historian's task was to exculpate their nation from any assumption of war guilt. Renova and Zechlin serve as examples here, though both of them became a little more liberal in later years. Moreover, neither in Britain nor elsewhere did international history establish itself as the jewel in the crown of the historical profession. Temperley, for instance, had entertained hopes for the Regis Chair when it fell vacant in 1927. And GM Trevelyan's appointment to that post meant, I quote, goodbye to the daydreams of enthroning modern and diplomatic history on the Regis Chair. Even so, the field continued to grow and to develop. Later generations, especially in Britain, uh, resorted to the neologism of international history to signify an interest in broader historical patterns, including financial ties and um, intellectual currents, commerce, and the military. In fact, the field has grown so much that one distinguished historian of American foreign relations was forced to conclude that international history is so broad a term that it loses its usefulness. So our little circle line train uh, seems to have left the track somewhere around Aldgate now and is hurtling towards Whitechapel or some other station in outer Siberia. How, how can we get it back onto the right track without resorting to Mornington Crescent style leaps of the imagination? For there's no denying that the field has come under attack from within and without. So let's pause here and remind ourselves what at its core international history is uh, before we deal with the challenges. Diplomacy, like watercolours, suffers from the fascination it exerts on the amateurs. 
and that is just the Foreign Secretary and would be envoys to Washington. That is what I might call the Ferrero Rocher fallacy. Foreign policy was and, as current events confirm, remains one of the most important functions of state activity. It is one that reveals the operations of the given political system or its failings. Historically, foreign affairs helped to crystallize thinking about contending notions of the national interest, thus articulating ideological ideas and associating them with specific political groupings. International history is primarily concerned with events, and to that end, we, international historians, compose, as A.J.P. Taylor did, timelines and diaries of the actions of the participants so as to create a tight chronology of intersections. Two further considerations are linked to this. It is necessary to study international history from at least a bilateral, preferably a multilateral perspective. The problem with foreign affairs, of course, as I always tell my students, is that they involve dealing with foreigners. And I hasten to add, this is not a sort of little Englander's lament um, at the influence of others. Uh, far from it. It is simply a statement of fact. Um, different cultural contexts, different historical experiences, different geographical locations explain, amongst other things, why different countries form divergent views of a particular matter, why they will see it in relation to diverse objectives and how they will frame distinct policy responses to it. Such experiential differences may be uh, quite sharply developed. As Bernard Lewis has shown in his thought-provoking work on the Islamic world, or Jürgen Osterhammel and Ort Arne Westart in their books on China. Even in the more familiar European context, such differences, though often nuanced and subtle, are still significant. I need not label the point. Just follow the news on the preparations for the Brexit negotiations. As Hegel wrote, without relations with other states, the state can no more be an actual individual than an individual can be an actual person without a relationship to other persons. Or more appropriately, um, just as a football reporter cannot capture the dynamics and the flow of the match by focusing on just one team, so the historian cannot simply concentrate on one side alone. The second consideration is that we must never separate the study of policy from the appreciation of the instruments on the understanding and the use of which success depends. International history, then, requires a certain degree of technical competence, an understanding of the different ways in which states interact with each other. But amidst all the eight memoir, the bout de papier, and the note verbale, one must not lose sight of the official apparatus um, through which international relations were and are conducted. Foreign ministries were the nerve centers, what modern sociologists call knowledge-based organizations, or in the colorful, if slightly unappetizing, analogy of a Victorian diplomat, they were the digestive organ in the capital, connected with the fee diplomatic feeding organs, um, the embassies abroad. The chief function of this organism was to gather, store, analyze, and retrieve policy-relevant information so as to ensure informed decision-making. Red tape enthused another diplomat of the period, like drill in the army, is only a means to an end. It is the method by which a huge machine is made to move rather ponderously, but steadily and without confusion. So we need to make ourselves masters of that machinery um, in order to understand its significance. And I can already see some of my colleagues thinking that uh, working in modern academia must surely be a perfect preparation for understanding uh, bureaucracies. Um, you, you may think so. I couldn't possibly comment. Um, the international historian is not so much uh, concerned, of course, with form-filling. Th that is, as a researcher, as a, as a teacher, that's a slightly different story, of course. Um, so not so much uh, concerned with form-filling, rather with the way in which bureaucracies prepare political uh, decisions. 
This leads me to a further consideration, a further refinement. I referred a little while ago to the differences in the manner in which countries approach international problems. In doing so, I used a convenient shorthand. States are not black boxes, hermetically sealed against their surroundings, but somehow uh, interacting with each other. The reality is more complex. At the time of the American Revolution, Edmund Burke wrote that he knew of no way to frame an indictment of another nation. By the same token, there's something deeply unsatisfactory in the way historians have used, and still use, the name of a country, its capital, or even buildings and streets to denote international actors. As if number 10, the Quai d'Orsay, the Wilhelmstrasse, the Quirinale, Pevchesky Most, or Foggy Bottom were something other than bricks and mortar artifacts, as if they instructed diplomats abroad, uh, weighed questions of war and peace or of neutrality, cheated, dissembled, lied, and perpetrated genocide. I'm guilty of this myself. We all do it, and historians will probably continue to do it, but it is only a form of shorthand. What is needed then is a language and terminology which reflects more accurately the realities of power influence and responsibility. To develop this, it is necessary to prise open the lid of those black boxes, and inside them we find the actors. Political history and international history more especially is saturated with human agency. This is relatively straightforward in, say, the 17th century when one is dealing with a prince and a clutch of courtiers and conciliary around him. It becomes more complicated uh, with the passage of time, as military, finance, and trade departments began to intrude on international relations, later to be joined by bankers, traders, and experts of various kinds. In the short 20th century, especially towards its end, non-governmental organizations, supranational bodies, and media outlets assumed greater significance, and so add to the cacophony of voices to be studied. In all of this, however, people matter. Individuals make any system work, but the manner in which they conceptualize issues and frame their responses to them is shaped by the political system in which they operate. So it's a two-way process. The role of individuals, their particular ideas, assumptions, and beliefs about how they should act in the world remain key. The characteristics of an age are expressed in the manner in which contemporaries sought to rationalize uh, their particular situation, and perhaps more especially in the language and concepts in which such efforts were framed. These concepts, or cognitive maps, distort reality and scale, just like any other cartographical uh, projection. I, I, I stand corrected if, if, you, if you say this is not so, but you know, you're the geographer, I'm not. Um, nonetheless, these cognitive uh, maps matter. They therefore require calibration by the historian. As James Joll argued in his reflections on the unspoken assumptions that underpin decision making, politicians and officials are influenced by their own instinctive uh, reactions, traditions and modes of behavior. Social background, educational experiences and the recruitment processes of the power elites then fall within the remit of the international historian. In this way, it is possible to gauge the sense of the basic principles of foreign policy on which contemporaries uh, based their decisions. And this set of accepted understandings and unexpressed assumptions, um, the official mind, if you like, is thus the process, pro product of a historical socialization process. Occasionally, international historians will deal with exceptionally gifted statesmen who had clear um, strategic conceptions uh, of their policies. Olivares and Richelieu, Chatham and Frederick II and even Kaunitz were in a class of their own. And so were Bismarck and Salisbury, or in more recent times, the West German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt. More often, of course, policy making was more ragged around the edges, more haphazard and less consistent than historical reconstructions might suggest. It is important, therefore, to identify and differentiate the preoccupations and perceptions of policymakers. Perceptions may distort, but they are decisive. 
They are the filter through which information passes, however selectively, and is then processed, however incompletely. This filter is to no small degree uh, also conditioned by differences in generational experiences, and these too need to be elucidated by the historian. At this level, international history needs to be set in different national contexts. It has to be both international and national. They are two sides of the same coin, and neither can be understood without reference to the other. I do not mean to blur in a more or less elegant way here uh, the issue of primat der Innenpolitik versus primat der Außenpolitik, which so preoccupied scholars in the 1960s and 70s in the aftermath of the Fischer controversy about the origins of the First World War. Rather, it is meant to stress the interconnectedness between the external and domestic <coughs> spheres. There are other realities behind diplomacy which cannot be ignored. Not for nothing did Pierre Renaubin and Jean-Baptiste Durosel divide their broad survey of international history into two sections, of which the first offered a Brodellian analysis of les forces profondes, the underpinning structural elements, um, and the other, uh, an histoire événementielle, uh, the history of events, the, the great statesman in action. Indeed, historians ignore at their peril the interaction between economics and strategy. Appreciating such connections also allows us to throw into sharper relief global connections. To illustrate this point, very briefly, let us consider the end of the American Civil War. Its effects extended well beyond uh, postbellum US politics and society. The resumption of cotton exports after 1865 led to a glut on the market and plunged the monoculture cultures in Egypt into a deep crisis. It led first to an Anglo-French uh, financial takeover of Egypt and ultimately to Britain's occupation of the country in 1882. No less important than economic factors is the military dimension of international history. In a quasi-anarchic international environment, states pursue and are exposed to a type of competition in which military technology is a major component. Arms races, have their own historical dynamic of qualitative leaps, quantitative advances, and geopolitical spread. And they have significant political consequences. There was, as David Stevenson has shown for the years before 1914, no simple one-way road to world war. The dynamic of armaments uh, competitions on land and at sea nevertheless contributed to a growing sense of mutual insecurity and this became a critical problem in great power relations. Considerations of these aspects lead us to the, a wider systemic point. The interaction between states, the causes of war, the challenges of crisis management, and the problems of peacemaking are the principal focus of international history. As Clausewitz observed, the major and minor states and popular interests affect each other in the most varied and changeable manner. Each point of intersection binds and serves to balance the thrust of one against the other. Through all these points of intersection is revealed the wider cohesion of the whole. Thus, relations between all states serve more to preserve this whole in its current form than to affect changes within it. The Prussian general's en passant remarks offer two important insights. That the permanent and regular linkages and interactions between states create a form of system, and secondly, that one of the, uh, the system's goals is its own preservation. To maintain it, states and their international practice tend to establish basic rules and norms of behavior to regulate com competition and to temper violence. It is a sort of grammar, an agreed toolkit of international politics. As Paul Schroeder, the historian of Metternichian great power politics, has argued, the state system also has an enabling function. I quote, every international system to be stable and durable has to provide certain collective or public goods for at least the major participants. General peace, reasonable security from attack, recognition of status, sanctity of contracts, a general expectation that promises and commitments will be fulfilled and violators curbed or punished, and so on. International history proper 
is impossible unless it contemplates the systemic background um, against which foreign policy is formulated and executed. Some historically minded international relations scholars, such as Martin White, have emphasized the existence of structures within the system. Others have suggested that a more systemic approach furnishes an opportunity for identifying patterns in the apparently random and chaotic behavior of sovereign states. Such, appro such approaches go a little bit against our congenital distrust of theory and our insistence upon the uniqueness of the historical event. Even so, perhaps history is too important to be left to the historians alone, as Christopher Thorne once argued. There was a need for border crossings, the title of one of Thorne's books, intellectual journeys of discovery across lines of demarcation between the various cognate disciplines of the humanities and social sciences. And yet, crossing borders also means to acknowledge their existence. Not to do so runs the risk of blundering blindly across the lines and perhaps also becoming entangled in the barbed wire fencing along the frontier, from which no amount of habitual nodding to Bourdieu or Foucault or Said can free the historian. Crossing borders in a meaningful way uh, then means redefining them. So as our circle line train uh, proceeds on its journey and is now on its homeward uh, lap, it is becoming clear just what a vast terrain international history has come to cover. It is little surprising, therefore, that some scholars have concluded with mock horror, to quote Emily Rosenberg, that the discipline is not so much a methodological prescription, but rather a vast empty plain with undetermined borders. There have, however, been forays onto this terrain. International history, just as history in general, has been challenged from different directions by postmodernists and poststructuralists. Uh, a more recent tendency is to pursue a culturalist international history. In practice, however, in seeking to emphasize the self interested nature of all definitions of the national interest, frankly, I don't know what they were expecting, but there we go, uh, <laughs> culturalists wind up universalizing the domestic. The recent turn to global and transnational history has helped to throw into sharper relief um, borders transcending phenomena such as economic integration and migration, political and social movements, supranational bodies and their work, or the growth of professional and intellectual networks. All of this is to the good. The analytical flaw, however, lies in the difficulty of relating the transnational sphere to the motions of the state system. Indeed, it is notable that in transnational narrative, narratives, the, the state tends to be seen as a force of resistance that needs to be overcome in the onward march towards a global society. It is a latter-day weak interpretation of globalization, and it puts the horse before the cart. A managed and relatively stable rules-based international order facilitates the growth of the transnational sphere and not vice versa. As that fine liberal American historian C. Van Woodward once noted, the demagoguery, the cant, and the charlatanry of historians in the service of a fashionable course can at times rival that of politicians. The issue of gender has been explored. Frank Costigliola, for instance, has ingeniously suggested that engendering diplomatic language can reveal how emotive meanings can constrain and actively shape rational analysis. Uh, I think there's something in that. But it is difficult to see how far this side of the argument can be pushed. The small number of female decision makers is one obvious uh, obstacle. And it is remarkable also how recent studies of, for instance, the Empress Maria Theresa, or that other imperatrix, Margaret Thatcher, analyze their subject in terms of realpolitik and ideology. Another interesting and fertile area for international historians has been the aspect of myth, or what I prefer, collective beliefs, and their relationship with decision-making through historical analogies. Versailles, Munich, Yalta, these are all constructed historical shorthands uh, that imply collectively accepted lessons of the past and so establish a framework for decision-making. 
Some international historians have taken a leaf out of the work of the polemicist Edward Said and constructed Orientalist interpretations of, for instance, American foreign policy. Others have applied this idea of otherness or alterity to Southeastern Europe and have suggested Balkanism as shaping Western policy in that region. There is a danger here, as David Reynolds has pointed out, of reification, of making an intellectual tendency into a monolithic entity with dominant explanatory powers. All of these approaches can add to our understanding of international history. They can enrich it. Nothing exists in some hermetically sealed subdivision of our imagination or academic discipline. Everything is related to everything else, and light shines forth from distant places. But, mind the gap, postmodernity aims at nothing less than at liberating us from the coercive idea of reality and truth. In short, it seeks ultimate liberation from history itself. The new approaches, moreover, cannot replace the concern with top-level decision-making, more especially when things are on the cusp of peace and war. To quote Reynolds again, there has been a recurrent diplomatic twitch in the saga of international history. To ignore it would mean to fall underneath the wheels of the train of history. Historians change the questions they ask of the past. That is inevitable. The subject we historians examine is static. It is just that we are whisked, whisked along by time speeding away from the scene of action. And since our audience is on the same train, we can't get off while we still live. As the train moves on, um, so new vistas open up. And if that train ever did travel across an empty plain, well, that might have been true of the immediate post-Cold War world when it was considered to be safe now to declare the end of history and with it the triumph of Western liberalism. Things look, look rather different now. History does not seem to have come to a full stop. Western liberalism um, is, uh, is, is, appears to be beleaguered and the international landscape is far from empty and far from benign as new and old fault lines open up new mountain ranges emerge and nasty crevices appear. While culturalists and transnationalists and globalists fiddle out their reedy tunes, the world, past and present, is burning. It is scarcely surprising that in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, one prominent American historian thought that the next big thing would be some kind of revival or refashioning of diplomatic and or military history. International history, after all, is disaster studies. What was more surprising was that the author of these lines was the then president of the American Historical Association and a leading exponent of uh, the new cultural history, Lynn Hunt. This takes me back to my opening comments about relevance and the concern of the pioneers of international history with the practical applicability of their scholarly insights. Now, I shouldn't dream to suggest that writing a PhD thesis on Metternich uh, somehow makes for a good future foreign minister. Though in that particular case, I think the case actually is a strong one. It's Henry Kissinger, in case, uh, in case you don't know. My aspiration here is more modest and more ambitious. International historians must be like Isaiah Berlin's fox, who, unlike the hedgehog, knows many things, but who also understands that he can never grasp the ultimate course of things. All knowledge is nothing but an approximation of the truth, fleetingly and imperfectly glimpsed. Historians, however, can influence opinion and suggest ways in which problems can be analysed. If history teaches us anything, it is a certain sceptical mindset. There are habits to, uh, to be formed, as Maitland once put it. You see, I'm trying to ingratiate myself with my medieval colleagues again here by, by quoting this eminent medievalist. A particular current problem may not necessarily mean what it is said to mean, no matter how often that is repeated. We should seek to bridge the gap between scholarship and public policy. At a very basic level, the best way of working through a problem is to create Taylor's timelines with its intersections and explore the viewpoints of, of the other side, weigh the evidence and then suggest possible analogous situations. There is, admittedly, of course, an alternative. 
midnight tweets announcing that everything will be big and beautiful. It might not work, though. There is also no guarantee that politicians will listen. Margaret Thatcher, we know, was somewhat disappointed when in, the, in early 1990, a group of very distinguished British and American historians uh, signally failed to endorse her prejudices, personal and generational, against German unification. And even Lloyd George in 1919, who had scholars of the first rank at his side, was perfectly capable of ignoring them. He thought he knew more history than they, one of the experts wrote. But the historians were not entirely without influence. On one occasion, as the big four uh, were poring over maps in an effort to redraw boundaries, Lloyd George was puzzled because he could not find a place mentioned in the briefing papers and identified as very important. Where on earth could it be? The scholarly advice was prompt. If you move, move your big foot aside, you'll see it. He did, and he saw. We can advise politicians to tread warily and to make sure their big feet are put in a reasonably safe place. But historical knowledge and understanding are more than a political health and safety device. At a time when Enlightenment values are under siege, when ignorance is celebrated as virtuous, and when truth and fiction no longer seem to be polar opposites, a development to which historians sadly have contributed, the need for intellectual courage and leadership has rarely been greater. It is better to light a candle, it is said, than to curse the darkness. The historian's guttering lantern on the stern shines only on the waves behind, and the flickering light it sheds are perhaps not much, but they are still better than darkness. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Offer, for a stunning tour de force. It was a tremendous uh, inaugural lecture. So when you ask the question, why do we have inaugural lectures, I think you've just given us a really very good answer. I'd like to thank you for your contribution to the School of History in the years that you've been at UEA, your contribution to undergraduate teaching, some of the modules that you've offered, Redcoats, Napoleon to Stalin, and your special subject on the origins of the First World War, as well as uh, um, supervising an incredible range of um, uh, postgraduate students as well in um, MA theses and PhDs. And I think it is your range which is the most outstanding thing that we've seen today. This, this ability to not only range between countries, but also languages and to, to look at not just the, 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 what's going on within a country, but this international dynamic as well, which is incredibly pr um, impressive. Your CV, of course, um, uh, reflects this, this, this incredible range. I particularly enjoyed your, your book on on July 1914, which um, rather um, uh, magnificently came out on the 100th year anniversary of the, of the First World War. Um, and you've written um, an, a very large number of, of, of books. And what your, your work uh, reflects is your incredible knowledge of the archival sources. This is, this, is, uh, this is something which we're all very grateful for. I know that many of us, when we, when we have a question, a historiographical or an archive-related question, will go to Thomas because his knowledge of the, of the sources is, 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 is very deep and very profound. And I know that several junior colleagues, particularly Jan van Myren and um, Mark Thompson, um, have, have particularly benefited from conversations with you as well as uh, the professoriate. Um, and, and I think that intellectual generosity is also reflected in the, in the number of things that you've done in, in terms of being an editor. Uh, uh, Diplomacy and Statecraft is, is, a, is a particularly distinguished journal, but you've also um, edited a range of, of very um, interesting books. So you've rescued a lot of... Um, things from the past, and I think that, that's, that's, an that's an impressive achievement. So I would like to thank you for your teaching, for your research, for your overall contribution, and also to um, offer um, people here tonight the chance to ask you some questions, if we may. Okay, well, the, the question related to um, the American uh, intellectual debate, really, uh, in, in, in the years since 9-11 uh, about the status of diplomatic history, and I think David's point also was that um, diplomatic history, despite Lynn Hunt's 
prognostication didn't actually make a, a comeback within schools of history, within history departments. And that's actually true. Um, I certainly know from um, many colleagues in, in America that diplomatic historians tend to be in international relations departments, departments of public policy, or they're working for think tanks. And um, history departments have fought rather a rearguard action against um, it, what they might have considered as, as more traditional uh, forms of history. Um, now, um, in terms of what diplomatic history could contribute, um, I'm not entirely sure that I would um, advocate, as Graham Allison and Neil Ferguson did, the establishment of some council of historical advisors, not least because I don't want Neil Ferguson to be on it. Uh, <laughs> but, um, um, uh, you know, uh, councils of economic advisors in the past haven't got a particularly good track record of getting things right. So I'm, I'm, I wouldn't actually suggest that historians would get it right. Um, they might get it more right. Uh, what contribution can they make? They can certainly sharpen an understanding that there are no easy solutions, that there are no quick fixes, that one has to take the, the longer view. You know, that one ought to act a subspecie aeternitatis. Sorry, I'm getting very sort of um, Latinesque here and, and uh, standing at this le le lecture. Um, um, the, one of the things that I, I, I do remember William Hague once said was um, after he, he, he left the Foreign Office as Foreign Secretary, the, the, he said the one thing that he, he, he missed having when he was Foreign Secretary was having time to think. And I think there is um, there's a habit uh, to uh, come up with quick solutions uh, to problems as they present themselves in the here and now. There is certainly also a lack of awareness uh, that different countries may approach the same problem from a very different perspective. And then we're very puzzled why they're not as enlightened and sensible as we are about Syria or whatever the, the problem might be. So I think um, what it can teach is uh, humility and, and a sense of the longer term. So you see it, um, international history as having a role in education more than, more than in predicting the future. So uh, in military academies, for example, um, historians have a role to play, don't they, in terms of, 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 of teaching the young about the mistakes, the military mistakes and the military successes of the past. Um, so would you see the possibility of, a, of, a, of an academy for politicians, an academy for people to, to sit at the feet of international historians and learn about the mistakes and successes of the past? Oh, absolutely. Wouldn't that be a lovely idea? Um, sadly, I can't see any government spending money on such, a, um, on such, a, such an uh, uh, academy. Um, but I think you're right. It is about forming habits of mind more than anything else. And I would be extremely wary of historians and their predictions of the future. Um, you know, I mean, I'm very fond of him and I, I respect him enormously. But Paul Kennedy famously wrote a book about um, the 21st century, which came out in the early 1990s. Um, it made a tremendous impact uh, on the United States. It certainly led, it also had a policy impact in the sense that it led to increased spending on infrastructure. Anyone who remembers the United States in the early 1990s, you remember the bridges that collapsed and uh, enormous potholes and the roads and so on. So all of that changed in the course of the 1990s. But Paul also predicted that Japan would dominate the 21st century. He didn't see China coming. Um, and well, Japan isn't exactly dominant, and uh, China is what people talk about now. Um, you also get international historians, who, of course, who say, well, the rise of China is just like 1914, Britain and Germany before 1914. There's an arms race going on in East Asia, and we must be very, very wary of that and, and, and respond uh, accordingly. I think that's a very profound misreading of Chinese culture, political culture, and Chinese strategic interests and just the, to the general trend of um, uh, Chinese foreign policy. It's not about establishing hegemony um, in a bloody war. This is much more incremental if that, and you need to formulate very different policy responses to that. That's why I say you need to take the longer term. Yes, you need to have a sense of trajectories 
Um, but um, <coughs> predicting the future is a mugs game, and I think historians are particularly bad at that. Well, it remains to me to say thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for a magnificent lecture. Thank you. <laughs>